that's just your call. Um, well, welcome. Together we have the opportunity to approach God. It's a holy moment. We know where people gather in the name of Jesus, that he it appears, and that his Holy Spirit's moving. If you're a guest or visitor with us, uh, thank you for being here. We ask uh, that you make the most of this opportunity. We're different because you're here. Hopefully you're different because we're here, and we can be one community under the name of Jesus. Today we're looking at a particular piece of scripture, one that messed with me on April 2nd. I always do this. I start a story and never finish it, and then I get in trouble. I'll, uh, I'll try to finish the story in this service, and then the first service can get jealous. Um, jealousy is not all bad. And this scripture touched my heart in such a way um, that it, it called me to wake up. And this was the same scripture that was preached to the heart of Martin Luther 500 years ago, the book of Galatians, that caused him to do the same. And so I'm sharing this with you now. Uh, perhaps today is the day for you to experience something new and fresh, but I'll just warn you when you experience it, it's actually quite ancient and old, the Word of God. Verse 6 of Galatians 1. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one you called, the one who called you by the grace of Christ, and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have said already, so now again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let him be anathema, cursed, hellbound. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. We know these words to be trustworthy and true. Amen. So, as we begin, there's a, there's a one word that's used here that's used 44 times in the New Testament. It's the word we have for astonished. St. Paul's astonished. Um, it's the same word that's used when Jesus Christ stands on the water and then gets in the boat. No, he wakes up and he stills the water with his voice. It says the disciples marveled at this and said, who is this that even the water obeys him? In the same word, St. Paul is astonished. In the, in the same way as a youth pastor, you know, youth pastors aren't, aren't allowed to cuss, at least in front of the kids. And so, you use phrases like, wow, really? You thought that was a good idea. What were you thinking? You weren't. You know, it's just, I'm astonished. In the same way Paul's writing, I am Whoa, I'm astonished. You're leaving grace? Really? And it literally, it says, I am astonished that you are so promptly defecting from God, the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. It's a, it's a real similar expression we see in the Old Testament when God's led the people out of bondage and slavery into his loving arms, into communion, into identity, brings them to Mount Sinai to receive a word that's never been revealed to anybody. And while Moses is up on the mountaintop, Aaron's on the ground doing what? Building a calf. And God's like, I, I was going to give you Disney World and you settled for Joyland. <laughs> like, I love Joyland. But come on. I think Joyland and chiropractors have a, a racket. Okay. He's just so surprised, as Moses was surprised, that you would leave grace, 
and go to something else. And I meet a lot of Christians, and I am one of these Christians that's repenting, that says, well, I started with grace. I started with Jesus loves me. You know, the earliest songs you learn are the best. I started with that, but then I graduated. I matured into legalism, pragmatism, whatever. You do not graduate past grace. You only regress. And so before we do anything, I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to tell him this one thing. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. All right. Okay. So, <laughs> so Paul's writing to a church in Galatia. He's, uh, I don't remember if he founded this church or not, but he's writing letters to it. It's a good church, excellent book. If you're looking for one to read, it takes about 15 minutes. Um, and he's just shocked that people would receive the gospel, which has freed them from self-justification, self-righteousness, and they can't stay there. I'm just going to warn you up front. There's a reason that's the case, and it's because that even though a person is in Christ, your life is still accosted not only by the evil one, not only by the world, but even by your own flesh. That's why you have to have the gospel preached every day. That's why you have to look yourself in the mirror every day and say, listen, it's not my job to prove myself. I can't. I'm not good at life. But one who is good at life proved himself on my behalf. And if I have faith in the sufficient work of Jesus Christ, that alone matters. That's the gospel. And we try to graduate from that. We try to graduate to karma or, again, moralism or legalism. We try to outrun everybody else, say, well, I'm more uh, pure. Uh, I don't dance, drink, or chew, or go with girls that do. Uh, what I'm about to say is not, it's got, it's, this is the gospel which cuts across liberalism and conservatism to the basis of the problem we all face. And that is, before Jesus Christ, Scripture says, we were dead in our trespasses. We were like ghosts walking upon the earth, hounded by a voice, hungering for the one thing we've always wanted to hear, God's approval. The one who made you to come to you and say, that I want. And so to become likable, we've listened to a false voice that says, therefore you must prove yourself. Uh, the, the concept of justification isn't a, a religious one, it's a human one. For instance, uh, I heard recently, that, uh, remember the movie Chariots of Fire? It's the only song I ever learned on the piano. So I know the song real well, I know the movie a little bit. In the movie, there's a guy that runs the 100-meter the meter, the 100 meter dash, I guess the 110 back then, I don't know. And somebody asked him, why are you so stressed out? Why do you work so hard? Why do you care so much? And he says, when that gun sounds, I have less than 10 seconds to justify my existence. Oh, wait. Uh, you'll hear from other people, I've heard this as well from, uh, from parents to say, you know, I, I feel like I'm a, I'm a real mess up at times. I, I'm just a screw up, and I just, you know, and, and I don't get everything right. And I wonder what my, pro my purpose is in life. But when I look at my kids, that's why I'm here. The, the, the human heart is hungering for justification, to justify one's existence. I mean, that's, that's, not, a, that's not a church thing. That's an us thing. And if you can't get to terms with that and say, I have the same problem that somebody in a Muslim country has, at the deepest of my core, my bones want to hear divine approval, and so the only thing I've ever heard to receive that divine approval is to work for it? That is the false gospel that got preached to you when we got struck out of the Garden of Eden, when we could not get back to where we started. It got sewn in, and we've been preaching it, preaching it, preaching it, building religions around it. Even people that purport to be of Christ preach moralism and not the gospel. And that's what I'm here to to help us understand clarity on what Jesus has done, on what the church of Jesus Christ is built upon, and I'm having to repent 
because I have been practicing theological malpractice for years. I've been telling people, assuming the blood of Jesus does its work, but then focusing on your best life now. How to pray. How to read the Bible. It's because the average person, uh, if you're like me, raised in, in kind of a baptist scenario, will read the Bible and ask one question. What do I need to do? What do I need to do? But we'll skip the flower. I, I really didn't like Paul's epistles because they were too flowery. I would say, okay, got it. Yeah, the elect, the sovereign God. Yes, good. Benefit, Holy Spirit, great. What do I need to do? Just, okay, love your neighbor. Got it. Whew, I can do that. What? No, I can't. I'm real bad at that. Okay, what else do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? The only biblical response to the Word of God is repentance. The only appropriate initial response to the Word of God is to acknowledge what's been done and to let that make adjustments in your heart. It's completely backwards from what we've heard. World religions teach, if you behave, then you'll be accepted. The gospel of Jesus Christ teaches, because you're accepted, now your duty has become your pleasure. Whoa! Why didn't anyone ever tell me this? Well, maybe they had. Maybe I just didn't want to hear it. Because I still wanted to believe that I'm be at least better than that guy. And as long as I'm better than most people, I want to keep playing that game. But those of you who've been crushed by life, who've been addicted to meth, who've gone through difficult circumstances, who've made mistakes that you think make you irredeemable, you no longer want to play that game of comparisons to other people. You just don't want to, because it doesn't work. You've seen where that leads. It's exhausting. Well, St. Paul is talking to a bunch of people who got struck with this amazing truth that God has a gospel. It's his brainchild. God the Father came up with this. It's not normal. It answers a question we didn't know we were asking. You didn't know you were asking the question. I have to prove myself. How do I do that? Until I said it. You didn't know it was in there because it's so deeply hidden. So everything that we've done religiously, philanthropically, has been selfishly, I'm not using that bad way because we've all got it, as a means to justify our existence. We don't want to end up on the wrong side of history is the most modern version. We're paranoid. Do we kneel or do we stand? That's the new one. What's the next one? They're just, they won't quit coming. The gospel of God was thought up by God. It was accomplished by Jesus. and It is being applied by the Holy Spirit right now. And the gospel I'm about to preach does not have a neutral effect. It will either free a heart or harden a heart. I heard recently Jesus when he was talking to people and he said because I tell you the truth you don't believe. Not even though I tell you the truth no, but causally. The fact that the truth enters your life will cause a person to smell the scent of life or the stench of death. It doesn't leave a person where God found them. And so this morning, we're going to walk through three things that we see in Galatians chapter 1 about this. And it's, again, not a liberal conservative thing. In fact, this is usually harder for conservative people to hear, uh, churchy people to hear, Pharisees to hear. And I just got to say it. But he says, I'm astonished that you're turning to another gospel. First thing he says, which is really no gospel at all because there's only one gospel. Um, I grew up disciples of Christ, which is built upon the Enlightenment. It was right after the American Revolution. And so we can't help it, but we believe that the democratic process produces truth when it really just produces popularity. Um, we believe that we're fabulous. And, of course, God loves me. I'm so awesome. Um, I mean, look at me, right? Who wouldn't love me? And we believe that we are the authority, and Scripture answers to us. 
And so, as Disciples of Christ, I sat through many of pastor's classes where we wrote our own credo, which means we wrote our own creedal statement saying, this is what I believe, as opposed to this is what I accept. Now, if, I don't know. Uh, I've got a six-year-old son. He'll be 12 one day. That's when I was going through pastor's class. I wouldn't give him the keys to my truck, let alone the keys to salvation, say, figure it out. What do you think? It's like, what? We have become addicted into believing that whatever you feel must be true, whatever you experienced is the new authority. No longer do we believe that there is one gospel that Jesus was willing to die for. That's gotten into the American church so that we say, can't we just agree to disagree? You say tomato, I say tomato. Nobody says tomato. Come on. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so, do, do you see? There's only one gospel. It's God's property. It's accomplished by His Son, and it's being applied by the Holy Spirit. And our job is to stand on it, not tinker with it. Our job is to apprehend it, even if you don't comprehend it, but you're definitely not to change it. You see? When in doubt, just test drive it, but don't change it. The basis of liberalism in America, this is not political, this is religious liberalism, the tradition I come from, is it's, the, it's got good intentions. It's the art of taking God's eternal gospel that was before this country was ever even thought about taking the gospel and taking away the parts that are offensive so that people will accept it. But by the time they accept it, they're not accepting the gospel, they're accepting something that's been monkeyed with. It, it, historically, what happened in the late 1800s, we found out because of the Enlightenment, no one in the world would believe that Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. It's not fishes, by the way, y'all quit saying that, right? Fish, plural of fish, or for moose is not meese. Moose. Um, so, I know. So, <laughs> so the first thing we said was, well, we don't like the inexplicable, and so we're going to take that out. Jesus, somehow we're going to ask you to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, which is the greatest miracle, but when it comes to the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus just taught us how to share, and everyone ended up being, they were all hoarding, and when Jesus shared from the boys provisions, everybody else shared. And then, you, you know, let peace begin with me. You know, it, uh, everyone have a Coke, and then we'll be fine. And, and so that happened in the late 1800s. Forty years later, it turns out we couldn't swallow the concept, which is deeply, deeply offensive, by the way, and it's intended to be. We could not swallow the concept of the cross because how could a God that loves so, loves so well commit child abuse and send his own son to death, right? I'm, right? I'm right with you. That's been a struggle of my life. I've walked through that struggle. I understand it. However, the liberal church, the progressive church said, okay, you're right. Jesus didn't die for your sins. He didn't live on your behalf. He lived as an example. And this is what true love gets you. This is true love kills. You, you die if you really love. So, Jesus is our moral example. So, I'm not going to say Jesus is an example. Do what Jesus did. That's great. But the primary thing of the gospel was not we learn a new law and we better follow it to justify our lives. It was not here's a bunch of teachings. Jesus is your guide, not your savior. No. It was the report from the battlefield. That's what gospel means. An ancient word before religiosity. It was a military term. Report from the battlefield. This is what has happened. What has happened historically is a man named Jesus, the Son of God, lived the perfect life that you could not live. He defeated an enemy you could not defeat. He was raised from the dead, so now that he lives, you can live. And if you have faith in the sufficiency of Christ, all of the delight of the Father is now yours. We live vicariously through Jesus. It's unbelievable, and it's still unbelievable to part of you today. That's why we're preaching it, because your flesh still sits here and thinks, yeah, but I got to prove myself, or yeah, but God doesn't know I did this. 
So number one, there's only one gospel. That's the gospel according to Scripture. That's the gospel consistently preached Old and New Testament. Once you see that and you start reading the story of David and Goliath, no longer do you read, oh, our job is to face our giants, which is a crushing new law. It just said, it's me saying, hey, suck it up. Suck it, pull yourself up by your, toughen up, stiff upper lip, get, you know, face your giants. No, no, no. The real story is you're one of those Israelites shaking in their boots while Jesus Christ, the better David, goes and defeats the bigger Goliath, the devil and death itself. You didn't do anything except stand there and wet yourself. Jesus did it. Now that Jesus has done that, you're free to walk in that freedom, to face giants, to do certain things, but the, the primary meaning of the gospel of Jesus is not what do you have to do, but what has been done for you. Do you see? That's, that's the clear gospel. Not more law, not more, not more moralism. It's repent and just say what Jesus did is good enough for me. Now, this is the sermon for a different day. Don't be a jerk. Don't be mean. Don't be hateful. But that's not the gospel. That's an expression of a person who's heard the gospel. Way too much moralism being preached as if, as if it's the gospel. So number one, there's only one gospel. Number two, he says, evidently there are some people throwing you into confusion, trying to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. St. Paul, from the first days of this church, highlighted a truth that was going to remain in the church even to this day through the end until the final consummation, Jesus Christ appearing. There will be agents who will come and consistently work to corrupt, pervert, and water down what Jesus Christ has done. And the problem is some of the things they say sound real good. They itch your flesh. Um, Pelagianism was probably the most important one that's been around. It was determined to be a heresy. A heresy just means something that is blatantly outside the lines of Scripture. The modern American church just accepts heresy and acts like it's normal. To be called a heretic isn't a bad word. It just means you're wrong. Um, I was in seminary, and I remember going to one of my professors, I was all excited, and I said, okay, I got it. I was really struggling with some stuff, so I said, I don't, I found a loophole. What if Jesus was just like me, just like you? He was born, we'll leave the virgin thing out of there, but he's just born, and he lived a life, and then he submitted to baptism. The day he was baptized, he was anointed in the Holy Spirit, just like we all can be, and God then said, now this is my son. And my seminary professor smiled at me and said, well, then you'd be a heretic. And I was like, oh. But, I mean, that really hurt my feelings. I didn't realize that literally she means this was handled in like 15-whatever as a heresy that a lot of people were believing. They bounced it against Scripture, against tradition, and said, no, this is actually denying the gospel. This is denying, you know. Well, several heresies have gotten in, and one of them is called Pelagianism, and it's the belief that the human being uh, is basically good, and all we need is some guidance uh, we're ignorant, and if God can give us some guidance, or a nice person can give us some guidance, and we work together, we pull on the same side of the rope, it's the good news of human beings finally getting our act together. The Bible says that we're basically corrupt. You're like a really sweet Camaro in pieces in the garage. You're not the mechanic, you're the Camaro. Go. can't fix yourself somebody has to come fix you you're sweet once you're put back together but as you stand no not so much and so these heresies have come into the church over and over again so that if you're sitting in a pew you'll hear jesus christ died for you so that now you have the opportunity if you follow his teachings and if you're a good person and if you vote a certain way most churches say, and if, and which they should lose their tax exempt status, by the way, and if, 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 then the gospel, they say, is God gave you an opportunity to save yourself. It's not the gospel. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ says God's going to come in and kick down doors and take you for him. All you can do, imagine Moses is on, you're with Aaron, Moses is on the mountain, and everyone's, you know, I don't know what to do with my hands. I don't know what to do with my hands. The best thing, that the greatest thing you could do is absolutely nothing. Whatever you add is negative. You're going to make golden calves. You're going to add to the equation. You're going to say, Jesus is not sufficient. I'm going to add works to this. I'm telling you, friends, the gospel of Jesus is so hard to believe because accepting what's been done on our behalf and not lifting a finger and hearing that voice shut down that says you have to prove yourself and letting Jesus be your attorney and knowing that the delight of the Father is yours through faith alone that is so countercultural. It's so counter carnal. It's unbelievably new. It's the only thing that can give you new life. Born again. There's a reason it's trying to be perverted. And there's a reason it's believed when it is. And I've been one of these people who not only believed these things, preached it, and got it wrong. And I'm here to repent. You're not saved by what you do. You're saved by what was done. Last thing I want to say, thank you for your patience today. Jesus, whenever he met Peter, they walked together, and then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Jesus said, you're, Peter said, you're the Christ. And Jesus said, wow, God did that in you. Peter, that confession makes you a rock. And upon that rock, upon that confession, upon the gospel, I will build my church. Just because something's being built, if it's not built on the gospel, just because something's being built doesn't mean it's a church. Breaks my heart. Just because something's being built in the name of Jesus, just because there's a cross on the wall and a band, and just because if it's not built on the work and sufficiency of Jesus Christ, if it's not on that, it's not a church. It's an expression of the world with religiosity so that they can either feel okay or judge others. But it ain't the church. I'm here preaching this sermon because this is in line with the series about our future as a church, I will be preaching the gospel of Jesus, and I'm repenting right now. Something happened to me April 2nd. I was at this convention, was reading the scripture, got struck with, this is all that matters from, from my job. My role is to preach the gospel, not to preach church growth, not to preach moralism, not to tell you how five best steps to pray. My job is to make sure you hear the gospel because you're not going to hear it anywhere else. You might hear another church that's a gospel-centered church, but you're not going to hear it in the world. And it's so critical that as the world gets noisy and people start buying for your attention, they're going to start telling you to prove yourself, to justify your existence. It's so critical for you to, to, to say, in the face of the world, in the face of your flesh, in the face of the enemy, I can't prove myself. I'm not even going to try. But I will trust in Jesus, and then I'm going to live for God's glory. The only reason he has me on earth any longer, as soon as I believe, I could just shoot up to heaven, right? For me to die is gain, to live is Christ. The only reason I'm here is because he will be glorified in my testimony. He'll be glorified by finding one more person who's willing to live by the gospel and not by self-justification. Not by moralism, not by hate, but by grace. My friends, this morning, may we receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we rest in it. May we say, I don't even know what to do with my hands. That's okay. But may we trust that even if we not lift another finger, faith in Christ enough, is enough right there to completely change your entire life. To say, Jesus lived the life I could not live. But through faith, it's as if I had. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for the time we have here and the, the patience of these good people. And we pray that your gospel would produce a move in people's hearts. That people, that, that, that this congregation, that myself included, would would trust in the ancient brainchild that you came up with, that your son came for, that your Holy Spirit's preaching. 
May we be surprised. May we be quick to associate with the, the, the condition of wanting to justify ourselves, of being broken. May we understand, may we never lose sight of that, that we're saved by grace, not because we're just super awesome. At the same time, Father, may we run to you, cling to you, and encourage others to do the same. May the gospel be proclaimed, and may our unity as a church be based upon not what we've done, but what Jesus has done. May it be so, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we sing our closing hymn, I'm normally in the back. As we sing our closing hymn, this is an opportunity for you to do all sorts of things. You can stay seated, you can stand. If you'd like to come forward on the first couple of pews, I'll be up here to pray with you. Scott's in the back as well. Let's stand.